Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. It's been a while since we did one of these, so I might be a little rusty, but we are solving unique binary search trees too. We already solved the first one of this, I think actually like three years ago now, but better late than never to solve the second one. We're given an integer n and we want to return all of these structurally unique binary search trees, similar to the first problem actually. Except in the first problem, we were just counting the unique trees. In this case, we actually have to build them. And your first observation in that case should be, well, the first problem, we used dynamic programming and came up with a pretty uh, optimal solution. I think it was n squared. Now, if we actually have to build each tree, it doesn't really matter how efficient we make our code because we literally have to build each tree. Our solution can't possibly be more efficient than the number of binary search trees that we actually have. Have. So that's the first observation. Now the second one, and this is the same as the first problem, this is a binary search tree, not just a regular binary tree. And you really have to be careful about that because if you assume it's just a regular binary tree, you're solving a completely different problem, which is a lot more difficult. This is actually more simple than you might think because if we're given an integer n, we assume that there's one to n nodes. In this case, that is one to three. Now we can pick any of these nodes as the root node. In fact, we should pick each of them as the root node. One, two, and three. Let's start with one. Now, what is my choice? Because before we had a choice, we could choose any of these three. Now you tell me, what's the choice? Remember, it's a binary search tree. We can't put a two on the left side. We're not allowed to do that. It's a binary search tree. That's not the property. All values greater have to go on the right side. So what we learned here is that both of these have to go on the right side. Now we could either choose two as the right child or choose three. But if you're smart, you notice that this is kind of a sub problem here. Now we are looking for all of the unique trees we can create with this smaller set of numbers. We're not even worrying about this guy anymore. Naturally, this problem can be solved recursively, and we don't have to keep track of each number. We just have to keep track of the range of numbers because the range is always going to be continuous. And that's even more clear when you have two as the root node, because when we have two here, we can only take this set of numbers and put them on the left side, and we can only take this set of numbers and put them on the right side, and we have to create all binary search trees doing that. It's pretty simple when you just have one on each side, but you can imagine that there's going to be more. There could be two nodes here and two nodes here. Just to illustrate that a little bit, I'm going to go back to the previous example, and now our range is going to be this. We're going to focus on the right side. And now we're making the same choice as we did earlier. We can either choose two or choose three as our root node here. And we're trying to generate all possible subtrees that we can put here. And we're going to return those subtrees up to our parent to this guy. And then from here, we're going to generate all possible trees with this guy as the root. And then we're going to return that. And that's actually going to be our solution for this problem. So I hope the logic is becoming clear, even though that this is not like a straightforward problem. So how many trees can we create here, well, one, we could take two as the root, and at that point, we only have a single choice, right? We can only put three on the right side. If we take three as the root, we can only put two on the left side. So we have these two possible subtrees, and each of them can only go in this position. So we can generate two trees with one as the root, and you can see both of those trees here. Two is more straightforward. We can just put a one and three. Three is similar but opposite of this guy, which is what we would expect because both of the nodes in that case would have to go on the left side of three. Now, it's very obvious that there is some repeated work here. Well, it might not be obvious from this example, but you can imagine if we had a very, very large set of numbers that we're working with, that a lot of the subtrees would come up in many cases. Like each of these subtrees might go as like the child of a value like four. This tree could be the left child of four, but it could also be the left child of five, believe it or not, because if this tree is the left child of five, then the four could possibly go here as the right child of three. So then we'd have something that looks like this. Basically, 
the idea is that a lot of these subtrees are going to repeat in many places and we can use a dynamic programming technique similar to the previous problem called caching and that's what I'm going to do but I'll also say that you actually don't need to do this to solve this problem because this isn't real dynamic programming. We still have to, in a sense, brute force this problem because we still have to generate every single tree. We can save a little bit of work, but it really doesn't optimize this problem. And I'm not gonna go super in depth into the time complexity. Leak code actually does have an editorial, but even they mention that for this problem, you should not be expected to derive the time complexity. It's exponential. I think it's roughly four to the power of N with a term below that. But again, I think this is very, very specialized math and we are not gonna discuss it. Now let's go ahead and code it up. I'm gonna start with our generate function because like we said, the sub problem is defined as the range of numbers. We don't have to pass in a list of nums. We just have to pass in the boundaries of our range. You could call it start and end, but I'm going to call it left and right. That's a bit more uh, intuitive for me. And there's a couple edge cases. One is, what if we just have a single node? That case would be when the left and right are equal. That means our range is of length one. And in that case, we could just create a single tree node and return it with like the value of these two. They're gonna be the same value. Now, in our case, we're actually not gonna return a node from generate. We're returning a list of nodes, remember? The way I'm gonna call this generate, I'll show you, is gonna be like this. I'm gonna call it from one to n, because that's our initial range. And then this is gonna generate a list of trees, just like we expect here, and then it's gonna be returned from the outer function. So I expect generate, our helper function, to do the same. So here, I would actually return a tree node with the value, let's use left, we could use either one, and I'm gonna wrap that in an array. So that's one base case. Another case is where our range is now empty. That would happen when the pointers cross each other. If you're not sure why that's the case, I would continue with the rest of the recursive solution, but it'll become obvious why that's gonna happen at some point. Left will eventually, it should usually be less than right, but eventually it's going to be greater than right. Eventually the pointers are gonna cross, and in that case, we could return an empty array, but you're gonna see why in a second, why it's gonna be good. Actually, for now, I'm gonna I'm just gonna put an empty array. It'll make more sense when we actually get to the rest of the code. So now we don't execute any of the base cases. Now we're ready to actually build our list of trees. And the first thing I wanna do is iterate through all possible values. Just like we talked about in the drawing explanation, any of these values in the range from left to right, and we add a plus one here because Python is non-inclusive. This is non-inclusive, so it's gonna stop at right but any of these values could be the root node. So that's something to keep in mind. So we wanna create a tree node with this value and call it our root. But we also want to build all possible left subtrees with the remaining values, but which values can we use in the left subtree and which values can we use in the right subtree? Just like we talked about, I'm gonna call our helper function because now this is clearly a recursive problem and which values can we use on the left side? Well, everything to the left of this value. So the left boundary is gonna be our original left boundary and the right boundary is gonna be val minus one. Now it's kind of clear at some point, the pointers are gonna cross each other. So that's why this is going to execute at some point. Now, the result of this recursive call is building all of the left subtrees. So if we wanna build the right subtrees as well, we can also call the function, and now you can probably fill this one out, but we want all values to the right of this value, so we set the left boundary to be uh, val plus one, and the right boundary is gonna stay as right. Now, what do we wanna do with all these subtrees? Because we're trying to brute force this. We want every combination of these subtrees. How do we do that? Well, the easiest way I know of is using nested loops. So I'm gonna say for left tree in the return value of this call, and then I'm gonna put the next guy here for right tree in this one, and then every combination, we're going to build a node. So I'm actually gonna take this and move it 
down here. So I can pass in a couple more parameters, which you can see defined up here, the left and right children. And I'm going to take the left subtree here and the right subtree here. And then once we've built that guy, we're going to go ahead and append it to the result that we declared up here. Now, this is the part where I want to make it clear why in this return, we have to put a none here or a null if you're using a different language. But it's possible that in our range of values, like for example, when we were having one, two, three, if we take one as the root node, then these guys are going to go on the right side and one is not going to have any left children. So what's going to happen with this line of code? Generate is going to return an empty array. That means this loop is never even going to execute. Even though one does have some right children, we're not going to get them. That's why we have to put a null here, because at the very least, we know one is going to have a null as a left child, and it's going to have some right children, which are going to be maybe a combination of whatever those guys turn into. But that's the reason why we can't just return an empty array from here. Now, after that's done out here, we're going to go ahead and return the result that we just got done building. Now I'm going to run the code to make sure that it works. And as you can see, yes, it does. And it's pretty efficient. You might be able to make it slightly more efficient if you add caching. So I guess I'll quickly show you how to do that, but it's not much more efficient. So for example, we're going to create a hash map to cache all of the repeated subtrees. And actually another quick little optimization I can show you is that this case where we just have a single node, isn't that already being handled over here? Because our loop will execute one time exactly if they're both equal. And then our left subtree is going to turn into null. Our right subtree is also going to be null. We'll build the root and then we'll append it and return it. So this is actually redundant. We don't need that because this code is handling it already. Now to add the other caching case, what if we've already solved this sub problem before? If this is in DP, then we can return the result that's already stored in there. That's not enough. We also have to insert into our DP cache. So right here, before I return the result, I'm going to go ahead and add it to the cache just like that. So now let me rerun this. I don't think it's going to make a huge difference in terms of the runtime. Uh, actually, it did, but I think that's pretty random because I ran it before and it didn't make a huge difference. But oh well. If you found this helpful, please like and subscribe. Check out neatcode.io. It has a ton of free resources to help you prepare. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.